Good morning. Before we begin our service, I'd like to share with you the following announcements. Uh, the Rummage Committee has made the difficult decision to, uh, via vote to cancel this fall sale. We wanted to provide revenue for the church, fellowship for our congregation, and low-cost goods to our communities, but the continued threat of the pandemic and a major, and a major logistical problem with the sale proved to be insurmountable obstacles. Thank you to everyone who signed up early to volunteer. In that regard, we were looking good. But wait, this doesn't mean we're not doing anything. Stay tuned for news of an alternative. We may check off some of the boxes yet. Signups are open to dedicate flower arrangements for our chancel on Sunday mornings. You can dedicate a flower arrangement in honor of or in memory of a loved one or in honor of a cause, milestone, or special occasion. You can find the sign-up <clears throat> sign button in the Thursday email and on our website under worship links. Please contact Ginger Luckins with any questions about flower dedications. The humanists of BUC are meeting virtually this Sunday, on, excuse me, on Sunday, September 19th from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. The theme of their meeting is my credo, and they are looking for speakers on this topic. If you would like to speak at the meeting for up to five minutes, please contact Larry Larson. Attention BUC gardeners. Awareness is growing of the benefits of the environment, the planet and ourselves of cultivating native plants. To support a healthy ecosystem and to make the world more beautiful, your BUC environmental action team is planning BUC's first ever native plant seed sharing event after service on Sunday, September 26th. We ask gardeners to begin collecting their, the seeds and seed heads of their native plant species through September. Look for more information about the event soon. Welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church and our Labor Day service. I'm Paul Vachon, your worship leader for today's service with Chris Slon, our worship associate with music provided by Tom Raffle. BUC is by design an inclusive church. We enforce no preset creed nor impose any artificial barrier, barriers on our community. All people of goodwill are welcomed here and valued. At present, we are gathering exclusively in this virtual format but soon, very soon, uh, we will move to a hybrid model, which will include in-person wor in worship in our beloved sanctuary. And now our service will begin. Some people say a man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bone. A man that's weak and a back that's strong. You're loading 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Saint Peter, don't you call me. Cause I can't go, I owe my soul to the company store. I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine. Picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine. I loaded 16 tons of number nine coal and the straw boss said, well, bless my soul, you're loading 16 tons, and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. If you see me coming, you better step aside. A lot of men didn't. A lot of men died, I got one fist of iron, the other is steel. If the right one don't get you, the left one will. You're loading 16 tons and 
What are you getting another day older and deeper in debt? St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Our words for our chalice laying this morning are, are, are by Tara Humphreys. Whether you are from the South, the East, the North, or the West, whether you were born into this faith, found it, or it found you, whether you feel at home or are still trying to find your place, whether you believe in God or are open to mystery or still have no idea, whether you are unemployed, underemployed, cobbling things together, overworking or in school, whether you are holding anxiety, grief, confusion, anger, hope, restlessness, or deep peace, Unitarian Universalism has a place for you. It is right here. And this chalice is lit for you. Our opening hymn this morning is Wake Now My Senses, which is 298 in uh, Singing the Living Tradition. <laughs> Wake now my senses and hear the earth call. Feel the deep power of being in all. Keep with the web of creation your bow. Giving, receiving as love shows us how. Wake now my reason, reach out to the new. Join with each pilgrim who quests for the true. Honor the beauty and wisdom of time. Suffer thy limit and praise the sublime. Wake now, compassion, give heed to the cry. Voices of suffering fill the white sky. Take as your neighbor both stranger and friend, frying and striving their hardship to end. Wake now, my conscience, with justice thy guide. Join with all people whose rights are denied. Take not for granted a privileged place. God's love embraces the whole human race. Wake now my vision of ministry clear. Brighten my pathway with radiance here. Mingle my calling with all who will share. Work toward a planet transformed by our care. Opening words for Labor Day by Megan Visser. We enter this sanctuary for kindness and comfort. May rough worn hands and aching backs be healed. We enter this sanctuary of hope for equality. May those who labor to survive live to know justice. We enter this sanctuary of love and vocation. May our bonds of solidarity be strengthened. We enter this sanctuary of courage and friendship. May we proceed hand in hand toward freedom. One of the ways we know ourselves as Unitarian Universalists is our commitment to social and environmental justice. We are currently focused on four justice areas, environmental action, economic equality, civic engagement, and racial justice. 
We support this work by sharing our Sunday morning plate collection with a community partner that shares our values and commitment. Our recipient through September is one of our partners in economic equality and racial justice work. Walt Whitman Elementary School in Pontiac is one of our most cherished longtime partners. Our work at Walt Whitman supports learning for K through five students by stocking and operating a mobile library in the school, conducting a Bananagrams program and tutoring. Your offering can be submitted through Venmo, username at BUCMI, through our website or a check in the mail. Half of this morning's offering will be used to buy books for Walt Whitman's library and supplies for the school year. Let there be an offering in support of our congregation and our good works. This morning's offertory is If I Had a Hammer by Lee Hayes and Peter Seeger. Uh, feel free to sing along if you know the words. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land. I'd hammer out danger. I'd hammer out a warning. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters, all over this land. If I had a bell, I'd ring it in the morning. I'd ring it in the evening, all over this land. of my sisters all over the land. If I had a song, I'd sing it in the morning, I'd sing it in the evening, all over the land. I'd sing out danger, I'd sing out a warning, I'd sing out love between my brothers and my sisters all over the land. Well, I got a hammer, and I got a bell, and I got a song to sing all over this land. It's the hammer of justice, it's the bell of freedom, it's a song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. This is the time in our service where we lift up our joys and concerns, news of life-shaping events that bring us great joy or sorrow. Here in this virtual space we gather, called by our sense of urgency, our duty or the longing for community, called to be together this day. Here in this virtual space we are gathered, called to do our part in weaving a web of human community. Here in this virtual space we gather to share our joys and sorrows. No joys and sorrows were submitted for this morning, but I would like to express my personal joy over hearing that the Oakland University administration and faculty have arrived at a new contract agreement, overdue and not without contention. I trust that it will uh, prove to be an equitable arrangement that will benefit the entire OU community. Spirit of life, God of love, I am entwined by your delicate web of mutuality. The, li the life energy that makes me reach for the sun also moves me to be, uh, become wrapped like the strongest bittersweet vine and the delicate sweet pea around those I meet and love. Here in the tangle of my daily life, I feel your pulse and sense what it means to be alive. Here twisted and knotted, I thrive, seeking the light that will pull, for, pull from me the fragrant blossom of love. Spirit of life, help me to experience the beauty of your interwoven and intricate web, that I might always embrace without reserve all those whom my life touches.
To say that Walter Ruther was a leader in the Detroit labor movement is like saying Muhammad Ali was a boxer. While it is true, there are volumes left unsaid. Between 1946 and 1970, when he died, Ruther built the UAW into a force big enough to counterbalance the might of corporate America. He used that influence to advocate not just for workers' rights, but for civil rights, women's rights, universal health care, public education, affordable housing, environmental stewardship, and nuclear non-proliferation around the world. Our reading today is from a speech broadcast on the CBS radio, news, radio network on Labor Day in 1958, in which Ruther lays out his agenda for America's future. He said, we have made great progress in America, but human progress is relative not an absolute value. We must measure our progress by the potential of the tools with which we must work. Measured by this standard, we have not made the progress that the tools of economic abundance make possible. And there remains much unfinished work on the agenda of American democracy. As a nation, we need to work out a list of national priorities. We need to sharpen our vision and we need to rededicate ourselves to the basic human and democratic values that we believe in. And we need to put first things first. We need to overcome the serious deficit in education, which is denying millions of our children their rightful opportunity to maximum growth. The American labor movement can be proud that it was among those who pioneered for free public education. American labor shares the belief that every child is entitled to an educational opportunity that will facilitate the maximum intellectual, cultural, and spiritual growth. We need to wipe out our slums and build decent, wholesome neighborhoods. We need to provide more adequate medical care available to all groups. We need to improve social security so that our aged citizens live out their lives with a fuller measure of security and dignity. We need to provide all our citizens without regard to race, creed, or color, equal opportunity in every phase of our national life. We need to develop more fully our natural resources so that continued neglect will not put it in jeopardy the welfare of future generations. This Labor Day, let us reflect on Ruther's words and consider the ongoing struggles of the labor movement in the context of our principle of human worth and dignity. For almost two centuries, Detroit has been a center of manufacturing. Before it was automobiles, the city's factories churned out stoves, marine engines, and railroad cars. Smaller shops made anything from shoes to clothing to cigars to ginger ale. But producing these products required an intangible commodity, the effort and toil needed to make them a reality, in other words, labor. The burgeoning waves of immigrants that arrived in Southeast Michigan beginning after the Civil War <clears throat> prompted the need, provided the needed muscle while providing, while molding Detroit into a bona fide industrial town. Newcomers from Ireland, Germany, France, and the UK exploded the population from just 45,000 in 1860 to almost 300,000 by 1900. 
Subsequent waves during the 20th century would include arrivals from the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and, and Central America. Early on, workers and, and the businesses the newcomers enjoyed an unexpected alliance where labor and management worked to advance their mutual interests. During the mid-19th century, for example, the Detroit Typographical Society claimed both print shop owners and journeyman printers among its members. The organization worked to provide sick benefits to workers while enhancing overall practices of the trade. But soon greed took over, prompting managers to creatively cut corners to boost profits, such as employing part-time staff and contracting out certain tasks. As industry became more complex and specialized, the now familiar adversarial relationship between labor and management took root. The dawn of the auto industry saw a rekindling of labor activism in Detroit. Prior to the adoption of the assembly line, manufacturing, manufacturing early production cars was, ve was a very labor intensive endeavor. Metal finishers and woodworkers constructed the chassis on sawhorses. Machinists assembled the engines and drivetrains, while skilled upholstery workers stitched the leather seating. The automaker's desperate need for skilled labor gave workers a significant advantage, and the newly formed machinist union granted primacy to labor in determining wages and working conditions, including the closed shop tradition, which dictated that only union members in good standing could be hired. Employers, however, soon confronted this obstacle by, co by colluding and forming networks of strike breakers, non-union workers who could be brought in as replacements in the event of a work stoppage. As the auto industry matured technologically and more tasks became automated, including the introduction of the now famous assembly line, the need for workers was reduced, which shifted power to the automakers. During the 1920s and 1930s, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler became progressively more anti-union, while the onset of the Great Depression made auto employment even more tenuous. This period marked an escalation of the traditional worker versus management antagonism to an elitism that pitted the wealthy against the working class. For those who did hold on to their jobs, the routine was brutal. Nine and sometimes 10 hour days consisting of heavy lifting and assembly labor while keeping pace with an ever, ever accelerating production line taxed workers to their limits. Today, this intense toil is depicted in the famous Detroit industry frescoes by Diego Rivera at the Detroit Institute of Arts. As the depression grew more acute in 1930 and 1931, the hardships felt by Detroit's working families intensified. Plummeting sales forced each of the big three to make deep cuts to their payrolls. Magnifying the pain was the lack of unemployment insurance, social security, and federal guarantees on bank deposits. New Deal programs addressing these needs would not appear until years later. Political extremism soon filled this void, leading to the formation of, of unemployed councils of the USA and outreach of the Communist Party USA. On March 7th, 1932, members of the Detroit Unemployed Council, only some of whom identified as communist, staged a protest marching from downtown Detroit towards the Ford Rouge complex along 4th Street, arriving at the Detroit Dearborn boundary at Miller Road. Their stated goal was to personally present Henry Ford with an 11 point list of demands, which included a recall of all laid off Ford workers, abolition of the service department, a euphemistically named squad of company spies and thugs that brutally suppressed any hint of union activity, and a seven-hour workday. Their reception was anything but cordial. Waiting at the intersection was a line of 50 Dearborn police backed up by Ford Service Department personnel. Police deployed tear gas, most of which was dispersed by the wind. Marchers responded by throwing dirt and rocks while continuing to the plant's gate number three, Police and security then retreated to an overpass from which they unleashed water cannons and submachine guns, killing five marchers and wounding 19. Over the next few years, the nascent unions made efforts to improve the lot of workers of, by striking at various supplier companies, which provided modest, which proved modestly successful. 
But in January 1933, employees at Briggs Manufacturing, a supplier of auto bodies to Ford and Chrysler, struck the company's four plants. Owner Walter Briggs labeled the workers communists and used police and sheriff's deputies to disperse the strikers and escort in replacement workers. The company housed replacement workers in the plant, reducing the effectiveness of picketers. In 1935, Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act, also known as the Wagner Act, which legalized workers' right to organize and engage in collective bargaining. That same year, the United Auto Workers formally organized. It quickly realized that taking on large multi-plan employers such as the big three would be a better strategy than striking individual shops. The union decided to focus its attention first on General Motors, the largest employer in the industry. Union strategists, including Roy Ruther, the brother of Walter Ruther, Henry Krauss, and Wyndham Mortimer discovered that the dyes needed to stamp body parts for all Buick, Pontiac, and Oldsmobile cars originated from a plant in Flint, Fisher plant number one. The factory would make an ideal strike target. The union planned to strike in early 1937, shortly after Frank Murphy, a Democrat sympathetic to the labor movement, was sworn in as governor of Michigan. On December 30th, however, union leaders discovered the, the company's plan to move the dyes early the next day. Off-shift employees immediately forced their way into the facility and occupied it, a novel idea thought to be more effective than staging a picket line. By barricading themselves inside the plant, replacement workers could be prevented from entering. The strikers maintained their stance for 44 days, living off company, complimentary meals sent in by a local restaurant. Police made a few attempts to remove the workers, but to no avail. Governor Murphy even sent in the Michigan National Guard to protect the occupants. Meanwhile, the strike split spread to other GM facilities in Flint. After tense negotiations, the company capitulated on February 11th, agreeing to recognize the UAW as a legitimate representative of the hourly workers. Workers were granted a 5% raise, while open discussion of unionism was no longer penalized. For the UAW, achieving recognition at General Motors was a, was a tremendous accomplishment. In the aftermath, Walter Ruther and other union officials set their sights on Ford, but they knew full well that the Dearborn family-owned company would be a much more formidable challenge, as Henry Ford had long been strenuously opposed to labor unions. Ford enforced his stance through a feared network of company spies and thugs who were quick to fire or brutalize anyone suspected of pro-union activity. Their supervisor was Harry Bennett, a former boxer hired by Ford in 1921. Social attitudes regarding organized labor had changed considerably since the beginning of the Depression, but this letter mattered little to Bennett, and he and, he and his men imposed harsh dis discipline with quick dispatch. On March 26, 1937, UAW President Walter Ruther and his deputy Richard Frankenstein planned a leafleting campaign at the Ford Rouge plant. Dozens of UAW volunteers came out to distribute literature to interested employees at shift change. The union representatives were careful to remain on public property, including a pedestrian overpass over Miller Road, a spot recommended by Detroit news photographer James R. Kilpatrick. While Kilpatrick was shooting images of Ruther, Frankenstein, and others, a squad of Ford Service Department men appeared and savagely, savagely beat the union officials. Then they proceeded to attack members of the media, exposing film, smashing cameras, and confiscating notebooks. Kilpatrick, however, managed to slip away unnoticed amidst the mayhem. Upon reaching his car, he directed his driver to leave immediately. Moments later, the two were stopped by a Ford security guard who demanded their photographic plates. Kilpatrick complied and the car was allowed to proceed. It turned out, however, that the plates the photographer surrendered were blank he had hidden the exposed ones under the seat. Once developed, the images show the Ford service personnel's cruelty and were soon seen worldwide and seriously damaged Ford Motor Company's reputation. Tensions between a recalcitrant Ford Motor Company and the equally determined UAW dragged on through 1941. 
By April, workers at the Rouge had grown weary of the company's heavy-handed tactics. While less than a third were union members, on April 1st, the UAW nonetheless called for a strike. Most workers honored the, the walkout, except for a percentage of African-American employees. Over the years, Ford had been willing to hire black workers when other companies would not, instill, instilling loyalty to Henry Ford. Some did try to cross the picket line, only to face violent reprisals. Despite the lack of complete support, the strike dragged on into late May. Henry Ford was willing to close the plant permanently, so intense was his opposition to the union. But the rift within the Ford family grew, pitting Henry and Harry Bennett against his son Edsel and Henry, Henry's wife Clara, and finally boiling over. In an act of incredible bravery, Clara Ford played her ultimate trump card. Unless her husband negotiated a settlement with the union, she would petition for divorce. Only then did Henry relent. On May 26, a vote was held, which, which resulted in an overwhelming victory for the UAW. The party signed a contract on June 20th. Paradoxically, Henry Ford agreed to terms more generous than those sought by the union. Ford workers were to be paid more than their GM and Chrysler counterparts, and workers unfairly terminated for union sympathies were rehired. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the newly recognized unions wasted no time acknowledging the urgent national priority. Within just 48 hours of the attack, officials of the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, of which the UAW is a member, voluntarily took a no-strike pledge for the duration of the war. As Detroit transitioned to become the arsenal of democracy, dedicated workers supplied the muscle needed to produce the overwhelming quantity of military armaments and vehicles needed to assure the Allied victory. Most noteworthy was the Willow Run Ford plant in Ypsilanti, which produced B-24 Liberator bombers for the Army Air Force. By the end of the war, 8,685 B-24s had been built at Willow Run, almost half the, the total manufactured throughout the entire nation. The post-war era saw the gradual decline in the power and influence of organized labor. Today, while union representation remains strong among public employees, only 5% of workers in the private sector are members of labor federations. This is an unfortunate development for all American participants in the labor force. Many of the benefits workers take for granted today, like paid vacation, company provided health care, and extended maternity and paternity leaves, exist only due to the efforts expended by past generations of labor activists. Recent history, however, suggests a turnaround. Many millennial workers, particularly those in the high tech sector, are embracing activism. One noteworthy example is a 2018 strike at Google where 20,000 employees walked off the jobs to force a change in the company's sexual harassment policies. On this Labor Day, let us all be reminded of the continuous efforts all, of all working people can continue to make. These are the people that build our cars, clean our buildings, harvest our food, and protect our communities. Together, let us honor their sacrifices. Our closing hymn for today is We'll Build a Land, um, number 121 in the Gray Hymnal. <laughs> Bind up the broken, we'll build a land where the captives go free, where the oil of gladness dissolves all morning. Oh, we'll build a promised land that can be. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. 
We'll build a land where we bring the good tidings to all the afflicted and all those who mourn, and we'll give them garlands instead of ashes. Oh, we'll build a land where peace is born. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. We'll be a land building up ancient cities, Raising up devastations from old, restoring ruins of generations. Oh, we'll build a land of people so bold. Come build a land where siblings and cousins, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever flowing stream. Come build a land where the mantles of praises resound from spirits once faint and once weak, where like oaks of righteousness stand her people. Oh, come build the land, my people, we seek. Come build a land where siblings and cousins, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. We shall overcome when we can truly celebrate the diversity of contributions and talents offered by all people, we shall overcome hatred and prejudice and oppression. When we can truly extend our hands to one another in loving acceptance, we shall overcome the past that haunts us now. Living in peace and freedom, we shall overcome the wrongs that have happened and the debts left unpaid. Let us join together in that commitment to overcome, and let us say together, amen.